So here we are, Resident Evil 2. Now when it came time for me to decide which version I was going to review, the PS1 original or the remake, it was a hard choice. If you ask the fanbase which Resident Evil is their favourite, it's going to split into three camps. Resident Evil 4, RE1 Remake or Resident Evil 2. Now there's only one correct answer here. Bullshit. The truth of the matter is simply Resident Evil 2 Remake is the new canon for the story, so it felt right to include it in this series of reviews on the run up to RE Village. Eventually, I'll come back and revisit the original, but we have a long road ahead and not much time, so for now, it'll have to wait. Now as usual with my reviews, I'm going to split this up into plot, gameplay and presentation, but first before we do that, let's go through some history. Resident Evil 2 originally released on the PS1 back in 1998 to critical and commercial success. Critics praised the steps forward from the original outing, and it quickly became the default favourite for millions of Resident Evil fans to this day. Following the release of Resident Evil Remake in 2002, fans craved for Capcom to take a similar approach with Resident Evil 2, but we heard nothing for 13 long years. Then, in 2015, our prayers were answered with the greatest t-shirt of all time. We do it. The fandom broke into equal parts apprehension and excitement, wondering how far off the original vision the game would be. Would it lean into the action-heavy entries that defined modern Resident Evil, or would it somehow do the impossible and exceed our expectations? At E3 2018, we had our answer. The game looked sensational. I still remember my nuclear level pop-off watching it for the first time. To learn it was due out only a few months later was the icing on the cake. Resident Evil 2 launched worldwide on the 25th of January 2019 to critical and commercial success, netting sales over 7.5 million, which exceeded the PS1 original. Now this review I'll be talking through my experience playing the game two years on from its initial release, what I loved, and where I feel it falls short of its potential. Now we'll be going through spoilers, so if you haven't played the game yet, then get off YouTube and go play it. Then uh, come back, please, I, I need the subs. Now for the sake of clarity, I'll be basing this entire review and the different scenarios on my experience which syncs perfectly to the majority of players. Leon is scenario one, and Claire, scenario two. Or second run, if you will. Do you get me? Sir, yes, sir. Now that's all out of the way, let's dive into this. <laughs> September 1998, Raccoon City. Two months have passed since the Spencer Mansion incident of Resident Evil 1. Leon S. Kennedy is about to start the first day of a new job, working for the Raccoon City Police Department, the RPD. But on his approach to the city, he stops to fuel up and learns firsthand that this isn't going to be a typical workplace induction. After narrowly escaping death, he bumps into Claire Redfield and quickly starts getting to know her. Live around here? going on <laughs> <laughs> yeah. she's searching for her brother chris who she hasn't heard from for a number of weeks and upon getting into the city they're quickly swarmed by crowds of the undead and are split up vowing to rendezvous in the police station leon arrives first now this has to be the worst first day imaginable when you start a new role you'd expect to be the office lackey you automatically get the role of T-boy and work your way up to gain respect from your peers. When all your peers are walking corpses, they don't care how good your biscuit game is. The only thing left to do is to haul ass and find a way out. Now what begins as a quest to escape the police station and find help quickly turns into an investigation into what caused this to happen, who was at fault, and why we all should be taking notes from Leon. My guy has game in the worst scenario possible. Leon's motivations to uncover the truth and get justice is spurred on with the NPC you meet in his scenario, Ada Wong, who helps drive the plot beat to beat. 
Claire's scenario is similarly influenced by who you encounter on the journey. Claire, while searching for Chris, encounters Sherry Birkin, a little girl who somehow find her way down to the basement in the RPD. Her motivations quickly change to protecting Sherry and making sure that she survives the night. The use of these unique NPCs in each campaign to tell the story for each character creates a need to play the game twice through in a minimum to be able to see the full story. It sells the need for two campaigns much more than Resident Evil 1 does, from a plot perspective anyway. The questions you have at the end of Scenario 1 are all expanded upon with new scenes and locations in Scenario 2, and this works excellently to tell a complete tale. The plot in Resident Evil 2, compared to other Resident Evil titles, is very different. There isn't a big bad monologue in while they unveil their plan for world domination. This is entirely an accident, which has gone way out of hand. A story of revenge, love and loss, which is something I didn't remember on my playthrough in 2019, and one which stands out so much to me after playing all these Resident Evil games back to back for the past few months. Now of course, there are similarities. There's betrayals, abuse of power and corporate greed, which are staples of the series, but it's the way it's woven and portrayed to us, the player, which makes it really stand head and shoulders above most of the entries in the franchise, and it's all sold through character. I'll compare Resident Evil 1 to Resident Evil 2 for this example. In RE1, we learn that Wesker betrayed Stars for his own purposes right near the end of the game, and this is a big shocker to Jill and Chris. But to us, the player, we've only encountered him a handful of times across the game. We don't have any emotional connection to him as a character, and so his betrayal is just a, oh right, I knew I shouldn't trust a guy that wears sunglasses indoors. Ada, being a true femme fatale, pulls a similar card showing her true colours while the whole base crashes down around us. But the difference here is we have been with Ada for hours. We played as her. We've seen her and Leon interact throughout the story. And so this portrayal, albeit obvious, is much more emotive. Now there's countless examples of this throughout the game. Kendo and his daughter. Annette on a deathbed regretting not being there for Sherry. Marvin slowly dying and then reanimating as a zombie in the foyer of the RPD. I never expected to get an emotional response from an RE game, outside of shitting my pants in fear and feeling the disappointment in my wife's eyes as I shuffled to the bathroom. Did I just say that out loud? Unlike the 2002 Resident Evil remake, which sought to improve upon the original game rather than reinvent, RE2 remake went in a different direction. They focused on modernising the game. They decided that tank controls and fixed camera perspectives wouldn't wash today. Now we all know how I feel about them. So how did they modernise? Well, the over the shoulder perspective was chosen. Now this has been the standard for third person RE since Resident Evil 4. And it's not exactly been to the benefit of the series, especially on the horror front. This camera change affects every aspect of the game. You can't have the same level design and enemy layout as the original outing, as you'll see threats way before they can be threatening. You also can't rely on door opening animations to create a sense of unease and apprehension. So how did they attempt to create the same oppressive atmosphere while giving the player the ability to move and aim much more freely than before? Well, they decided to obscure threats. A clever combination of darkness, limited field of vision with the flashlight, low fog, and clever level design to hide enemies just out of sight, and implement this with the lessons learned from the original Resident Evil right through to Code Veronica. A use of sound. For you to hear there's something in the room, that forces you to find where the sound is emanating from, all the while white knuckling the controller for what you're inevitably going to encounter. Now it goes without saying this isn't my preferred setup for Resident Evil, however, I was, and am, still in shock on how well this works for Resident Evil 2. It truly is sensational. There are many positives I can give to Resident Evil 2's modernization when it comes to gameplay in particular, but the one that has the biggest impact on the overall experience is enemy design and the roles that they play. Now let me explain. Zombies they're back. 
For Resident Evil, we haven't seen them front and center since Code Veronica. Now, by the time 2019 rolled around, we had more than our fair share of zombie experiences. They aren't scary anymore. Or so we thought. So how do you recreate that feeling of dread which has long since passed? You make them literal bullet sponges, and then restrict the ammo to the point where engaging one in combat is a real tactical choice, while upping their damage to a two-hit kill on hardcore or three hits on standard. Now I mentioned earlier the extra freedom in movement for our protagonists, with the new camera and movement options, but this is immediately sweep from under you with extremely tight corridors and environmental obstacles that you need to maneuver, all the while dodging strategically placed zombies who, when they get sight of you, will approach menacingly. Sure, you can outrun them, but if you need to get past them in one of these corridors, you better make sure you clench that ass, because they'll find a way in if you slip up. Lickers. Now these skinless, brain-exposed bastards are a nightmare. They hit like a truck, have the speed to catch you the moment you expose yourself, and they take an absolute beating from the biggest arsenal you have access to. But they have a weakness. Sound. If you remain quiet and walk slowly, you can slip by them. The feeling of being moments away from your potential death as you watch it scuttling towards you only for it to walk right past at the last moment is truly remarkable. Mr. X. He's the Terminator. He will stop at nothing to hunt you down and fist your face. He relies on sound and sight to find you. You shoot a weapon and he's there in seconds. You run too loudly too close to him and he'll zero in. And it absolutely will not stop. Ever. Until you are dead. Sure, you could waste a shit ton of ammo to stop him. But within 20 seconds, he's up and back in the mix. It's never worth it. The mix of these three enemy types combined is the secret source here to creating a level of tension and regret not felt in any Resident Evil game to date. Zombies, space denial. Lickers, for slow, deliberate movement. Mr. X, run, for your life. Now go with me on this walk as I paint a picture for you. You're going back through the RPD to get to a safe room. You've walked this corridor many times before, there's a liquor around the corner, and one zombie. You can shuffle past the liquor, avoiding the zombie's sightline, and dip right behind him before he gets a chance to turn around. No problem. Then, Mr. X bursts through the door. You have to run. The plan immediately goes to shit. The liquor pounces on you, and you use your last self-defense item. The zombie is alerted and immediately cuts off your path. You can't turn back as the liquor is getting back up, and Mr. X is on that ass. Now this is next level enemy design. They all have a role to play, which when combined create a no hope situation that makes you wonder why you chose to keep that one enemy alive. The design on these three enemies in particular make the basic fundamentals of a Resident Evil game come to life. Resource management, item scarcity and proper route planning. In a way not achieved in the series to date, now unfortunately, it doesn't stick to this winning formula for long. As soon as you step foot outside of the RPD and head into the sewers at the halfway point of the game, the quality drops substantially. Sure, the zombies still show up consistently, and in certain points they can prove to be a pain, but without the threat of Lickers or Mr. X, they don't have the same bite. Instead, we get the G-Adults. The amount of ammo to take these guys down is ridiculous. And to me, it felt like their inclusion here was solely to use your resources, which really isn't as interesting as the three enemies I've highlighted already. Things do perk back up in the lab with the introduction of IVs and one liquor infested room, but it's not a patch on the first half of the game, not even close. Now I do have problems with this game, and as we've opened the door onto the negatives, we might as well explore them. The puzzles. Where are they? Sure, you've got memory games with the portable safe combinations and solutions to lockers hidden in file pickups or written on whiteboards across the station. But I mean real puzzles. The ones that require items to solve or specific solutions found within the environment, the kind that make you scratch your head and think, who designed this madness? 
You've got a couple, like the chess pieces and making the plant 43 herbicide. But outside of those, it's really straightforward. And even those ones aren't remotely challenging. It's a real shame, especially after coming hot off the heels from playing Resident Evil 1. The difference here is worlds apart. Now I praise the inclusion of two separate campaigns in the plot section, and I do believe the implementation of this is way superior to what we got with RE1 Remake. But I believe there's some real missed opportunities that could have elevated the experience even further. In the original Resident Evil 2, they incorporated zapping. What this meant is one playthrough with one character will impact the subsequent playthrough with the second character. So for example, if in Clear A, you chose to collect the submachine gun and side pack, these items wouldn't be available for Leon B. Now there are 9 instances of this across the original Resident Evil 2. Seeing it not appear here in Remake is a real shame. There's so many opportunities to make the scenarios wildly different from each other, where you inadvertently make the subsequent playthrough much easier or harder based on the choices you made with whoever turned up to the police station first. Now there are differences between the first and second runs, regardless of character specific story elements. Key items change location, certain items aren't possible to collect from run 1 to run 2, which changes the routes across the RPD. Mr X appears much sooner in second run, and both characters get unique bosses and arsenals, which are all positive. However, as soon as you leave the RPD, the difference in routes fades dramatically and it all becomes a bit samey. The simple act of one character's choices affecting the others would have added that extra layer of tactical depth to the gameplay, which would have made multiple playthroughs a real joy to explore. Now as it stands, I can't see the value in multiple playthroughs outside of the first two runs, like there was with the original PS1 release. So in summary, Resident Evil 2 Remake took a big gamble in changing how we approached this game compared to its original outing, from the camera to movement and enemy design, and for the most part, it's a wild success. Unfortunately, the game is very uneven, with the first half of the game wildly outperforming the second half, and a lack of meaningful puzzles throughout to add that oft overlooked key component in the Resident Evil formula. Using the RE engine, which was first utilized in Resident Evil 7, Resident Evil 2 Remake looks absolutely stellar. Two years after its release, it still looks sensational. The environment looks lived in, wet, dank and dirty, yet very, very real. The way your torchlight shines off the blood splattered on the walls and bounces back at you through fog is captivating. Now nowhere is the attention to detail more realized than the character models and enemy damage. When you shoot a zombie, you don't get minor marks and sprays of blood like you would in most games. Here, the flesh literally rips off their bodies as you unload into them. Gay! Seeing a zombie's head peel open from a shotgun blast, or exposing the kneecap on a zombie from a couple of love taps with a pistol, is grotesque in the best way possible. The attention to detail on this context sensitive damage is unbelievable. What also adds to this level of immersion is the character performances from the entire cast. Now if you've seen any of my previous reviews, I'm always saying it's good, but nothing stand out. Here is the complete opposite. Everyone is perfect in their role. Excellent script work, mocap and line delivery are all key to eliciting an emotional response, which they certainly got from me in spades. Now across the different sections of this review, I've mentioned time and time again the tension and fear I felt playing the game. The biggest contributor to this is sound design. Resident Evil 2 Remake incorporates 3D audio to levels which were at the time unheard of for video games. Kentaro Nakashima, the audio director at Capcom, explained this three technologies at work here. A real-time binaural system, the first ever stereophonic sound technology of its kind, impulse response creation, and Dolby Atmos support. All of these in tandem mean the stereophonic sound quality is clear, with the direction of sound sources having a presence and real weight. With the impulse response creation, the size of the environment you're in, 
will impact how that sound sounds. It will carry in an open environment, echoing as it travels, whereas in closed spaces it will thud. These improvements to sound which weren't possible in the PS1 original elevate the terror to new heights. Hiding in a room and hearing the approaching stomp of Mr. X as he searches for you is terror incarnate. There were multiple times my wife came in to chat to me and I was sat with the game paused, clutching my chest as my heart felt like it was going to explode. And most of the heavy lifting here was accomplished just with the sound of footsteps. It's truly exceptional. Resident Evil 2, in my mind, has one of, if not, the best soundtrack out of the entire run of Resident Evil games. The themes of the RPD and save room are iconic. Now, the new soundtrack holds its own and is enjoyable. Hearing familiar notes as an homage to the original is a brilliant touch to bring that slight wave of nostalgia before flooding in with a new take. I don't think it's as good as its original outing, but that could be nostalgia guiding me more than anything else. Being a newer title, you get the benefit of a boatload of improvements to the player experience to alleviate common complaints, and nowhere is this felt more than the map. Resident Evil 2 Remake, in my mind, has the best map system in the entire series to date. Being able to view which rooms are fully searched, which aren't, and the items you left there to collect at a later time is a small change that has massive implications to the user experience. Add on to this the ability to see which doors correspond to which key on the map, and you've got a winning formula. Taking memory out of the experience so you can plan efficiently and quickly is superb, and stands out so much to me after coming hot off Resident Evil 1 a few weeks earlier. Resident Evil 2 Remake had big shoes to fill, Remaking any game is always going to cause headaches for how you make it feel unique, while at the same time honouring that which came before, modernising while staying true to what made the original so iconic. This kind of pressure is doubled when you've already set the bar for what a remake can be with the original Resident Evil remake. The team here can stand proudly with what they've created. It's certainly not a perfect game, and there's missed opportunities with a lack of engaging puzzles and an uneven experience which, after peaking in the RPD, never quite rises to meet it, but with standout performances from all the cast, fantastic sound design and graphical prowess, all the while balancing the old and new in the gameplay department, it certainly is nothing short of exceptional. I honestly don't know if it's better or worse than the PS1 original. They are different games and different experiences, and each of them have parts that are done better in each version. To even be torn on that is a sign of how successful this game is at capturing the Resident Evil formula and refitting it for both newer players and returning veterans. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, put a like on it. Let me know your thoughts on the game in the comments below and subscribe to the channel for more Resident Evil content. The next entry will be Resident Evil 3 on PS1 before we dive into Resident Evil 4, I do hope to see you then. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other, see ya.